Hi, my name is Grayson. I hope you're having a great Saturday. It's Scout Saturday Live! It's Scout Saturday Live! With Nathaniel Cox, Charlotte Green, Cameron Irvine, Bailey Vincent, Sam Yamosta, and your host, Miranda Janae. And now, Miranda Janae. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Saturday. I'm your host, Miranda Janae. Now, we all know that many outdoor locations like parks, campgrounds, beaches, and even trails just like this one have been ever closed over the last few months. But now, they're finally starting to open back up. Scouts and their families are starting to get back into the outdoors, going camping, hiking, and exploring. It's time to reconnect with nature. Some scout camps are closed this summer, but others remain open. We have plenty of parks that we can enjoy, though. Let's go, then. Hold on, Chase. Before we can go, we have to make sure that we're prepared. Like, pack my basic bathing suit? Yeah, that's true. But there are also a few other things we need. It's been a while since we've hit the trails and ventured out into the wilderness. So, being prepared means taking a closer look at the important things you should bring with you on any outing, especially when you're going far from home. Right, Taylor? Exactly, Sam. Whether you're a scout in a troop, a pack, a ship, or in a crew like me, we're all familiar with the 10 essentials we should have on our trips. With me today, I have my 10 essentials in my backpack. So, the 10 essentials I have are a fire starter, so I have matches and lint. I have a first aid kit, sun protection, so just normal sunscreen, um, a flashlight, food, so I have a cliff bar, extra clothes, rain gear, a compass, and oh, a pocket knife, and a water bottle. And in addition to the 10 essentials, most scouts add a few extra items to the list like a whistle, rope, and a signal mirror, which I keep in my backpack as well. Today we're going to be taking a closer look at some of the items. Now would be a good time to grab your scout backpack, take out your essentials, and follow along. The first time I learned about the essentials was when I was in Cub Scouts, although I learned about them in detail was when I was bridged over into Troop 10. Some Cub Scout packs have meanings about the essentials asking some older scouts to talk about whether 10 essentials are important, how to prepare for scout trips, and how to use some of the items. Well, today's our turn to do the same for you. Hey guys, so I'm here at one of my troop's favorite overnight spots or even just a spot for a really cool hike. So I'm here at Malibu Creek State Park. So many movies were filmed here, a couple of the more famous ones with Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and Pleasantville and a couple of others. All right, so before we head off to these old sets, you have to make sure that you have one of the most important 10 essentials, your first aid kit. So we have to hike to these sets, so we have to prep our first aid kits. So I'm gonna show you a couple different types of first aid kits that you can have. So this is a very simple one that I make with my troop. It's out of a little pill bottle, and you just wrap some duct tape around it, and then on the inside, there are some Band-Aids, some alcohol wipes, some Neosporin, and some safety pins. So some pretty basic bare bones first aid stuff. This is one that I take with me to school. So it has, you know, a bit bigger of band-aids, a bit more band-aids, a nice piece of rolled gauze, some orthodontic wax. I have braces, so I need that. And then as well, alcohol wipes um, and Neosporin. Now this is one that my dad has. And once I open this up, you can see it's a bit more extensive than the ones that I showed you. So a couple things that this has that I don't is a tick key, some tourniquets, um, gloves. So this is one that my dad has to use on other people. Well, not has to, but if the situation arises. Um, and both of these are just for whoever is carrying them. So this is just for me, this would be just for me. All right, so I don't really need gloves because my own blood, it doesn't matter. 
All right, as well as this has medication, neither of the ones that I've showed you have medication in them. So some of the most important aspects of first aid kit are the basic band-aids. Everyone needs band-aids, have a couple of different sizes of band-aids as well. Um, if there's anything personal that you need, that you need to carry in your first aid kit, for example, the orthodontic wax, I have braces, so I need that. Um, and then definitely carrying around Neosporin, al alcohol wipes, um, carry something to get out like tweezers. And then as well, another really important thing, especially if you're going on a hike, is something for blisters. Blisters are a big thing. I have dealt with blisters a lot. If you know, carry things like moleskin or blister band-aids, moleskin's the best. Um, and just try and be prepared for when you go on your hike because you never really know what's gonna happen. Um, just be careful and be safe and never forget your first aid kits. Thanks, Bailey. The next item we are going to be talking about is water. Especially on a hot day like today, you're going to need to drink plenty of it. I'm out here at Aliso Canyon, a local hiking trail near, near my house. And I just happened to realize that I'm running a little bit low on water. But thankfully, I know three different ways that you can purify water in nature. Let's take a seat over here. I need a little break. Water is essential for life and extremely important to both us and animals. One of, the, one of the best ways to purify water when out, especially with a troop, is by boiling it. Now, I will not be able to because my surroundings are extremely dry and I do not want to do anything to disrupt the environment that I'm in right now. But what you would do is you would put the water that you want to purify in a pot or pan, put it, place it above your campfire or camp stove, and let it boil. The second way we have is using a water filter. Now these are extremely fun, but they can be a little bit heavy. So it's better not, not to bring on huge excursions. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to untangle this very slowly and try to find an area where it is about two inches deep at least. So I'm gonna choose right over here. Put that to the side and unscrew the bottom. Make sure to clean out all of your equipment after you use it. I brought my Nalogene bottle and I'm going to screw it on the top. These bottles are extremely helpful because this, the size of the cap allows it to be used with a lot of different equipment. I'm going to put this to the side. So it is going to get a little bit wet, but we're out hiking, so what do you expect? I'm going to place it in the water. I'll let it float there for a second while I get comfortable. Bring this up and place this in the water at one of the deepest points. It's a little bit difficult, and I'm going to try to keep it submerged. Once I find my area, I'm going to start pumping. I'm going to do this for about 10 seconds and we'll see how much we can get. You can see the water going through the tube and into the filter, which takes out a lot of the sediment that we're picking up. There we go. It might take a little while, Unscrew it, place, place this to the side, get it untangled, and I have a little bit more, so you may have to do this for a little bit longer, but it is one of the best and most fun ways to purify water. So, I will be cleaning all of this up, but now I'm going to show you the last way which is my personal favorite, though I'll be honest, it's not as fun. <laughs> I'll 
I'll put this to the side for now, but I will make sure to clean it up before I leave. The second way we have is the, is one of the easiest and light to carry. So it's so it's extremely easy to carry on when you're hiking, backpacking, or even camping. And those are these little tablets, which help to purify any water that they're placed in. So even though the water that I have right here is clean, maybe I'm feeling a little bit skittish on whether or not it's as clean as I want it to be. I'm going to unscrew this, pick one of these tablets, and drop it in. It is hard to see, but I like to give it a little swish around and open it back up again to see if, it's, if it dissolves. Yep. So these tablets are made to dissolve and, hence the name, purify any water that you have. All three of these ways are extremely easy and easy to remember whenever you're out on any camping, hiking, or backpacking excursion. Because let's be honest, nobody wants to drink any dirty lake or river water. I know I don't, and you know you don't. <laughs> so always keep these in mind, because without water, we can't live. And make sure to bring at least 32 ounces in an allergen bottle wherever you go. Thanks, Miranda. Let's take a break from the 10 essentials, because it's time for one of my favorite parts of the show. We really love hearing from you guys and especially like seeing the thumbs up down below. If you have suggestions for the show, or your pack, troop, crew, or ship has done a cool project, or maybe you just want to say hi, then we want to hear from you. All you have to do is send an email with your parents' permission to Scout Saturday Live at scouting.org. We read every email, and some of them are read on the show. Like this one. Thanks, Fuzzy. This letter is from Alex in Troop 1155. Now before I read Alex's letter, I wanted to tell you that we would normally read two or three letters. But after we read Alex's letter, we felt that it is so important that we wanted to give this the attention it deserves. All of us can relate to Alex, and I'll bet that many of you might feel the same way. We also wanted to tell you that we contacted Alex to make sure that it's okay for us to read this on today's show. And we're so happy that he, let it, that he agreed to let us read it. So, here it goes. To all the hosts at Scout Saturday Live, my name is Alex, and I am a tenderfoot in Troop 1155. The last few months has been really hard because I had to go to school at home and was only able to do scouting on Zoom video calls. I know there are lots of other scouts who haven't been able to be with their friends or celebrate their birthday in a normal way or even go camping. And it makes me really sad and scared. But I wanted to say thank you for everything you're doing on Scout Saturday Live, because it makes me happy to run around the house for your scavenger hunts and doing all the projects you guys do. Thank you. Alex, first of all, thank you so much for your heartfelt note. I know I speak on behalf of Miranda, Sam, Bailey, Cameron, Taylor, and Charlotte when I tell you that we understand what you're going through. It's been a really strange time these last few months for all of us. Some days are difficult and some are easier. But what gives us comfort is that there are tens of thousands of scouts all over the world that are experiencing exactly the same thing as you. You're not alone and we appreciate your honesty. Alex, it took a lot of trust to send us this email. But more importantly, it is your bravery that we admire. Scouts are loyal to one another, and everyone watching should know that if you're feeling down, that it helps to talk about it. Talk with your family, your friends, teachers, or even us. We are all so honored to bring some fun into your homes and your lives. Thank you, Nathaniel. It's important to reach out for help when you're feeling a little lost. On a similar note, when I'm feeling a little lost on the trail, I know it's time to use my trusty compass See what I did there? I'm here in the San Bernardino Mountains. I will be teaching all of you how to use a map and compass together so you can find your way back to camp if you get lost. In order to use your compass, you must know the parts of the compass. First on our list, 
we have the base plate. This contains the orienting arrow, which must always face the direction that you are facing. And on top of that, it also has the compass housing. The compass housing contains the orienting arrow, the magnetic needle, and it rotates with a degree dial. I'm going to teach you all how to orient your compass. First, turn the orienting arrow and make it line up with the direction of travel arrow, like so. Now, rotate your whole body until the magnetic needle lines up with the orienting arrow, like this. Now, I'm facing north. That the since the magnetic needle is lined up with the orienting arrow, which is facing north. Now, I'm going to teach all of you how to read a map. So first things first, green usually is forested area, and blue is water. White is like barren landscape where there's just rocks or there's like little tree cover, and black dots or squares, those are man-made structures such as houses, schools, whatnot. And you, now that you see, you see all these brown lines, you must be wondering what those are. Those are called contour lines. That shows you how high you are. The closer together they are, the steeper it is. The farther apart they are, like over here, the flatter it is. I taught you how to orient a compass, and I taught you how to read a map. Now, let's put those two skills together, which are both essential, and see how the two work together. Now, I think I know where I am on the map, but I'm not 100% sure. So let's use our already oriented compass and line it up with the magnetic north indicator on the map. This adjusts for something called declination. Now you line the base plate, the side of the base plate up with it. Now you want to rotate the entire map with it until the magnetic north needle lines up with the orienting arrow, like so. Now the map is properly oriented and all the terrain features should match whichever way you're facing. This is a properly oriented map. We're at Maumere Creek Trailhead. Now, where that rock is, that's San Bernardino Peak. And if we pan up, there it is. I climbed that last year with Troop 719. Now, before we head out onto the trail, let's remember, leave no trace. Take only memories, leave only footprints. Let's keep nature, well, natural. So if you see any trash, even if it isn't yours, pick it up and then you throw it away. So far, we have covered first aid, water, and the compass. But let's not forget about something I can never go without, good food. I'm from the South, and we like to drink sweet tea and great home-cooked food. Whenever you're camping, you should not just eat food that tastes good, but food that's good for you. One of the best foods you can eat on a camp out is your classic trail mix, but you should make it your very own. My favorite trail mix recipe is called Friendship Trail Mix. How you make this is everyone in your unit, or if you're in a crew like me, everyone in your crew, brings their favorite trail mix item. Then you put it all together in a large bowl and divide it up so everyone has a little bit of Friendship Trail Mix. So, in my crew, I would bring granola, because I love granola. <laughs> Hannah would bring Cheerios. My VOA president, Adam, would bring gummy bears. Kinsey would bring cranberries. Uh, Christopher would bring beef jerky. Let's see. Um, Zach would bring popcorn. Dalton would bring baby goldfish. Uh, Morgan would bring peanuts. Lindsay would bring M&Ms, because she loves candy. And Henry, my president, would bring animal crackers. So I have went ahead and opened everything up and I'm going to pour it into this bowl. So I'm going to start with just some Cheerios. Oh, I like Cheerios, those are good. I might add more. Um, some granola. That's like the base of your trim Um, Some gummy bears. I love gummy bears. A little bit of beef jerky. I don't really like beef jerky that much, but lots, lots of MMs. Some cranberries. 
has a lot of cranberries, but cranberries are good too. Popcorn! Goldfish. Oh, they're babies! Look how tiny they are! Um, peanuts. <laughs> and some animal crackers! Oh no, they're stuck. There we go. So, oh, I don't want to make crackers fall. Now I'm going to mix it all up and divide it up into these little bags. So I took all of the friendship trail mix out of the bowl and I put them all in the little bags and I put everybody's name on them so everyone gets their own little bag of friendship trail mix. Taylor, nice job. Well, now I'm getting hungry. I'd like to share with you my trail food and trail snack recipe that I brought for today's hike. Here's a look at what I brought with me. I'm just going to be sitting here eating my snack. Here's how I made it. For this recipe, I will be using sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, M&Ms, pretzels, raisins, popcorn, almonds, and cashews. Also, it's a really good idea to use less sodium on the trail to not become overly thirsty, but using a little is good for taste. Just always remember to have plenty of water to drink. As always, if you need to remove or substitute some ingredients to a preference or dietary restrictions, please do so. Once you have your materials, all you have to do is season. You're going to want to season the nuts and seeds separately to your preference. Or you can get already seasoned ones, like I did. Then you can put everything into a container and shake it up. And then it's going to look something like this. Then what you're going to want to do is divide it into little plastic bags, like this one. Perfect. This works great for energy restoring snack that you can make at home. Another of my favorite trail snacks is burritos. Not too complex, but just simple ones. What I'm going to use for my burritos is potato, melted cheese, and bacon. They're delicious, hot or cold too, and it's a family favorite of ours. What's good about this type of food is that it can be used as a quick lunch or as a snack while hiking. So, now I'm ready for my hike. Now it's time to say give some shout outs to scouting units who are watching our show. Thank you all for watching and hello to Pack 942 of Safford, North Carolina. The first Haslin Beaver Scouts in London, England. Troop 376, Summers, New York. Pack 957 in Claremont, Florida. Pack 88, Gilbert, Arizona. Troop 72G, Rapid City, South Dakota. Pack 33 in Rapid City, South Dakota. Pack 351 in Portland, Oregon. Troop 22 in Woodland Hills, California. Ship 481, Canoga Park, California. Pack 409 in Rockford, Illinois. Pack 94 in Silomar, California. Silomar? <laughs> Silomar, California. Troop 202 in Rochester, New York. Pack 174 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Troop 1489 in St. Clair Shores, Michigan. Thanks, guys. Now let's welcome back one of our guest hosts, Ari Sanford. Today, I'm gonna show you how to use a signaling mirror. This is how bright the mirror can be. When you're trying to find a target, use your fingers as a sight. The way you aim your mirror is by putting your fingers in a V, like so. Then you put, point them at your target. Then you make sure that they're, they're high up and you look through the hole in your mirror. Then you start aiming your mirror till it hits your fingers, like so. And then that means it's also hitting the tree and our target. This is what a signal mirror looks like. You don't need to 
use a fancy signal mirror to do Morse code or signal people. You can just use an old CD or just a CD. That's how you do it. Great job, Ari. One of the most important ten essentials that I find myself using on almost every campout is my pocket knife. Like every tool we use in scouting, the most important part of using a knife is safety. In Cub Scouts, you can earn the Whittling Chip, and in Scouts BSA, you can earn the Toten Chip. While they cover similar safety-related material, one does not immediately translate into the other when you bridge over. You'll see why in a bit. Most of the knives I have are uh, these pocket knives, right, that are just a blade and have a locking mechanism. So when I'm working, there's no chance of it moving until I press that little button there and it folds back up. These are very effective, they're pretty safe, uh, but they are like for just a blade purpose. Other ones like this are great because they have many different tools and they're pretty light and small. Small blade, uh, there's scissors on this one, which I like, and there's also a file. These ones are great for Cub Scouts because the blades are pretty small and you have very little chance of hurting yourself with these as well. Here's one from when my dad was a scout. It's got all sorts of things on it, from screwdrivers and very large scissors and uh, lots of blades, which he happened to cut the tip off of that one somehow. I don't know how. But whatever kind of knife you use, the most uh, important part again is safety, and there are some basic things that apply to all knives. Number one is to keep them clean and keep them sharp. A sharp knife is safer than a dull one. A dull knife might catch on something and then you push a little bit harder and then it slips and you might hurt yourself or someone around you. A clean knife, if you do cut yourself, is also less likely to carry bacteria and give you an infection or carry something like tetanus that's associated with rust. Number two is having a safety circle. Uh, whatever you happen to call it, having like an arm's distance around you in all directions or having a rock to your back is a good safety measure to make sure that no one is close enough for to get injured while you're using your knife. You should also be wary of people going by you and people moving around or if you're on a trail so that you make sure to get out of the way or give your, them plenty of warning so they don't get hurt either. And number three, is to make sure to cut away from yourself. Now this may seem pretty straightforward, no pun intended, uh, but sometimes it's hard to keep track of when you're doing little detailed work and you might want to cut this way, remember not to. Using a very large knife is sometimes silly and unwieldy. It's likely overly dangerous for the job you're trying to do. A good rule of thumb that we use in my troop is that uh, especially with folding knives, that the blade should not be bigger than your th the width of your palm, like this. And the reason for that is that um, with folding knives like these, the blade is usually about the same size as the handle. So if the blade is smaller than your palm, uh, the handle should fit nicely in your hand, and it shouldn't be too big or too heavy for you to carry and handle properly. Oh, and remember when I said that the whittling chip and toten chip are not quite the same? Well, while the whittling chip is a good introduction to knife safety, the toten chip uh, includes safety for hatchets, saws, and lots of other sharp tools. It's a similar difference to learning about a subject in elementary or middle school and learning about it in high school or college. Trust me, there is a huge difference. One similarity, though, is that whatever kind of knife or sharp tool you use, you should have the appropriate chip on you. So I've got mine here, um, both sides, you know, laminated, etc. so I don't have to earn it again or something like that. And you need to have that on you whenever you're using a sharp tool um, so that people know that you know the right, the correct safety precautions. If you don't have it on you, that knife is probably going to be taken away. Use of knives with fixed blades like this um, are restricted in different states, counties, and sometimes councils too. Many governments restrict having knives um, of a blade three inches or more in a public place. 
Basically, make sure to ask your scout leader and do some legal research before you go anywhere uh, and make sure you know the rules of where you're going to use the knife. I think that's all for me. I hear Bailey is out here in the wilderness too. Okay guys, so right now I'm standing in the middle of the historic MASH filming site. Now they film both the TV and the movie here. So most of the scouts out there watching probably don't know what MASH is, but your parents and probably your grandparents will. So, um, when I was researching just some information about here, I had no clue exactly how many films and TV shows that they film here. It's about 150. So it's super cool to just be standing here. I've watched a couple of MASH episodes, but not that much. But, speaking of cool, check out some of the awesome videos that we got sent in by our viewers. All of you guys are going to receive your very own SSL collector's patch. Isn't that so cool? Now, if you guys want a patch, you guys have to send us a video or photo of any project that you see on our show that you created. Now, it can be a project from past episodes or one from today. All right, now you got to email your photos and videos with a parent's permission to Scout Saturday Live at scouting.org. One more time, Scout Saturday Live at scouting.org. Our next show is two weeks from today, on the 4th of July. We have an amazing show planned for all of you, so you don't want to miss it. Remember, you can go to our website at bsa-la.org forward slash SSL to view information about today's episodes, past episodes, our advancement tracker, and much more. Thank you so much to Avid Team for generously supporting our program. Avid Team is an online service that helps units plan and organize for campouts, Eagle Scout projects, fundraisers, and field trips. If you would like more information about Eventing, you can check them out on their website at eventing.com. I am finally finishing up my hike. That was so much fun. It's like every time you come here, there's another trail to explore. If you'd like to learn more about scouting or may know someone who wants to get in in all of this fun, be sure to visit BeASCOUT.org to find a scouting unit near you. Thank you all again for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing your project videos and photos. We hope you all enjoyed today's show and that you're a little bit more prepared to reconnect with nature. As you head outdoors, remember the outdoor code. Do your best to be clean in your outdoor manners, be careful with fire, be considerate in the outdoors, and be conservation minded. I'm Miranda Janae. Be safe, wash your hands with soap and water, and have fun out there. Bye! Where did he come from? Where did he come from? Come on, Joe. Give it up, bitch.